chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they said? What's this wisdom that's been given him? He even does miracles. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own house is a prophet without honour. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. If any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony to them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. But soft. What light from yonder window breaks? Tis the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art more fair than she. So, from uh, Romeo and uh, Juliet, within Shakespeare's play, Act 2, Scene 2, very uh, famous quote, uh, well-known words. And in that scene, Romeo is standing below Juliet's balcony, marvelling in all her beauty. And Juliet doesn't know he's there, but first at least then he's voicing her thoughts out loud, wondering why Romeo has to be a Montague and she has to be a Capulet. Why does it have to be like that? Juliet thinks a name is just a word and Romeo could easily take a new name and not be forbidden to her. Well, however, as we know, it was a bit more complicated than that. It was a scandal, wasn't it? It was a scandal. A scandal because the Montagues and the Capulets were engaged in a bitter feud. A scandal. For the residents of Jesus' hometown, it was a scandal. Jesus' words, the things he did, the very claims he made, were a scandal. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother, James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? What is sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Who does he think he is? Well, scandalizo, if I pronounce that correctly, is in fact the Greek word used here to describe the offence Jesus' neighbours took at who he was and what he was doing, what he was claiming. Scandalizo means to cause offence, cause to stumble, turn away from the faith. Sometimes we don't recognise a great treasure, a great blessing, even when it's staring us in the face. and. Um, Juliet, in the quote from William Shakespeare, was unaware that Romeo was underneath her uh, balcony and he was unaware of what she was saying, at least to start with, and then it all got going into after that. But, but can it be that we're there, we're in the place, in the very presence of what will bring us great blessing and not realise? Sometimes, I think we probably agree, we don't recognise a great treasure even when it's staring us in the face. Count the stories of people having lived with certain objects or artefacts in the house for many, many years, not realising they're, uh, they're worth a fortune until perhaps they take to the Antiques Roadshow or something like that. But let's listen again to the first part of the reading from Mark's Gospel. This time I'll read it in the 
message translation. He left there and returned to his hometown. His disciples came along. On the Sabbath, he gave a lecture at the meeting place. He made a real hit, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise all of a sudden, get such ability? But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude and Simon, his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling. And they never got any further. Who do you think you are? Just a carpenter. They weren't very impressed by the local boy made good, were they? They saw no deeper, inquired no further, asked no questions of themselves. Now, if I were to, uh, um, I suppose rhetorically really, because this is a video, if I were to ask you a question, a question like, hands up, if you think Jesus was just a carpenter, what would your answer be? Well, in actual fact, um, before we perhaps answer that, Jesus may have been more of a builder than a carpenter because that's what the Greek word tecton means. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, 55, describes this same event in, in Nazareth, but also uses the word tecton to describe Jesus' father, Joseph. A little digression to explain that word. Ancient tectones worked with stone, wood or metal. Most of the construction in Galilee at the time would probably have been in stonework. But Jesus could have built boats or shaped farming tools or whatever, we don't really know. This tiny village of Nazareth, perhaps with a population of about 150 to 200 people, wouldn't have supported consistent work. For the naming city of Sepphoris, however, that was the first capital city of Herod Antipas, was only a few miles from Nazareth. Sepphoris had plenty of building projects going on when Jesus was a boy, maybe in one of the places that he worked. So Jesus may have been a lower class day labourer, although he could also have been the, uh, the uh, master carpenter that we generally like to believe him to have been. The, uh, the Mishnah, that's a the book with the collected Jewish traditions in, says um, love labour and hate mastery. And seek not acquaintance with the ruling power. So being a, a day labourer wasn't so bad after all in that context. Well, if I were to ask you then this question, hands up if you think Jesus was just a carpenter, what would you say? Not many, I don't think, would describe Jesus as just a carpenter or even describe him as just a builder or whatever we're going to say. How else might we describe him? Son of God, teacher, healer, saviour. All these might be among the many words that we use to describe Jesus. And even people who don't follow Jesus, who don't believe uh, he's the son of God, will be unlikely to say, I think that he's just a carpenter or just a teacher. It's what the people in Nazareth said about him, of course, but we wouldn't agree, would we? Jesus wasn't just a carpenter. OK, then let's think for a moment about how uh, you would describe yourself. Are you a teacher, secretary, homemaker, manager, doctor, scientist, engineer, something else? Are you a man, woman, single, husband, wife, mother, father, child? If you were in your own thoughts, as it were, choose your own words to describe yourself, whether it's through a job, kind of what you do, a position in life, uh, something about your relationships, uh, maybe about your character. Whatever words we choose, would we put the word just in front of them? Are we just a homemaker, just a teacher, just a doctor, just a manager, scientist, husband, wife, single person, mother, father, child, or whatever description we've chosen? Now, of course, uh, uh, we may think of ourselves in that way at times. That's natural, kind of like human uh, human nature, isn't it? But how do we think God would describe us? Does God think we are just a retired person, just a mechanic, just a salesperson? I don't think so. 
we take one thing from this uh, sermon, one thing from uh, this passage, one thing from our reflections, let it be this, in God's eyes, no one is just anything. So let's repeat that, in God's eyes, no one is just anything. Each and every one of us is created unique, with a unique purpose, unique gifts and a unique mission in life. Even if we don't believe it ourselves, and I'm realistic to know that sometimes we don't and sometimes I don't believe it either. Even if we don't believe it ourselves, God does. Well, do we need evidence for that, I wonder? Well, if we do, here we go. Psalm 139 says of God, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. Works are wonderful. Is that what we call just another life? I don't think so. Isaiah 43 says of Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Is that just another relationship? I don't think so. Jesus himself says in uh, John's gospel, you're my friends. If you do what I command, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Is that just another job to give someone i don't think so whether we like it or not whether we believe it or not uh, none of us is just anything i don't think uh, uh, please don't um, go away from uh, these words believing that you're just something just someone it's not true Really. God puts too high a value on each one of us. So let's not go away thinking or believing I'm just this or I'm just that. God sees far more in us than that. God knows it's there because he put it there. Uh, why do I say that? Well, um, let's go with um, some words from Genesis. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. Or what about Psalm 8? What to be mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet, you made them only a little lower than God, and crowned them with glory and honour. Sounds to me like God has, despite all our failings, our challenges, our struggles, our lack of belief in ourselves, sounds to me like God has a pretty high opinion of us. Despite their struggles, despite their failure, the lack of faith, God has a pretty high opinion of us. We're uniquely created, individually loved and specially chosen. No one in the world is better at being you than uh, you. Nobody else can take that job from you. No one else in the world can do the thing that God created you to do. We have potential far more than we realise. God-given potential. Even if we feel very ordinary and like who doesn't you know, feel very ordinary and lacking uh, from time to time. If you feel very ordinary. It doesn't mean we're any less chosen by God. Um, a Chinese legend apparently tells of a group of uh, elderly uh, cultured uh, gentlemen who um, had frequent meetings to exchange their wisdom and, uh, and to, of course, drink tea. And each host on these occasions tried to find the finest and the most costly varieties of tea, creating these exotic blends to uh, impress uh, the guests. Or when the most uh, venerable and respected of this group entertained, he'd serve his tea with unprecedented ceremony, 
measure these from a golden box. And all those there praised his wonderful tea. And as they did, the host smiled and said, well, the tea you find so delightful is actually the same tea our peasants drink. I hope it will be a reminder to us all that the good things in life are not necessarily the rarest or the most costly. Well, you may not feel rare or costly. Uh, I may not feel that sometimes, but we're both. We're both rare and costly in God's sight. Jesus described the kingdom of heaven as being like treasure hidden in a field or a merchant looking for fine pearls. Probably the fine pearl, for example, the merchant sold everything he had to buy the pearl. That's how God feels about you. In God's eyes, no one is just anything. The famous American composer, Irving Berlin, um, that's the guy who wrote to uh, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, amongst many other things, once gave an interview. In it, he was asked, is there any question that you've never been asked that you'd like someone to ask you? Well, yes, there is one, he replied. And the question Berlin wanted to be asked was this. What do you think of the many songs you've written that didn't become hits? Uh, my reply, he said, would be that I still think that they're wonderful. I still think they're wonderful. May not have been a hit in the eyes of the world, but I still think they're wonderful. And I hope we're hearing that, the echo of our creator talking about us, the ones he's created. No one is just anything to God. God has an unshakable and unbreakable delight in what he has made. He thinks each of his children is wonderful. And whether they're a hit in the eyes of others or not, he will always think they're wonderful. And I hope that even on our difficult days, we can believe that and, uh, and be thankful. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you that you created us, you chose us, you gave us purpose, you gave us life and you showered so many blessings upon us and still do each day. We acknowledge that we sometimes find it hard to see that or to receive it, even when it's right in front of us. But nevertheless, help us always to hold on to the fact that in your sight, we are precious and loved. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, take care and uh, God bless you.